guys. Welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and avoid the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Okay, today's video um, is a very special one. Um, it's a video of my appearance on the Mind of the Warrior podcast with a good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Mike Simpson. Uh, I strongly encourage you guys to check him out and uh, check out the Mind of the Warrior podcast. Um, Mike and I have known each other for a very, very long time. Uh, we did our emergency medicine training at uh, Brook Army Medical Center uh, way back in the day and have remained good friends since then. Mike has had a 30 plus year career in the military doing some pretty uh, amazing stuff. He was an Army Ranger, um, Green Beret, multiple Special Forces deployments, and board certified ER physician with an EMS fellowship uh, under his belt, and is uh, is one of the probably one of the best uh, tactical combat casualty care instructors that I've uh, I've come across in my in my time. So, um, highly recommend him. He's also the author of a book called Honed: Finding Your Edge as a Man Over Age 40. And um, it's a great book. I uh, hope you guys check it out on Amazon. It's um, it's a lot of lifestyle advice that um, that he's used over the years, especially towards the end of his career in his late 40s, that allowed him to continue to deploy with special operations in uh, very austere environments, rugged environments with high physical demands, and allowed him to continue to do that into his late 40s and keep up with guys who were, you know, special operators essentially half his age. So. Um, Highly recommend that book for you. Uh, this podcast today, we talked, um, well, the topic is mostly testosterone therapy, but as most of the conversations that Mike and I have, it uh, tends to, to cover a lot more than that. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, let me know what you think uh, in the comments, and I will catch you next time. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Mind of the Warrior. Doc with you here. As always, special guest returning to the Mind of the Warrior podcast. A uh, good friend of mine, triple boarded physician, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, brown belt, soon to be black belt, all around fucking badass, Dr. Drew Wingy. Brother, thank you for coming back on. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been talking about doing this again for, I don't know, like at least a year. So You know, it, uh, we should almost, we should really almost do this once a month. As often as I, as often as I get yeah. asked. Hey, when are you going to yeah. do a podcast on TRT or when are you going to do a podcast on supplements? <laughs> yep. um, it's, you know, that's yep. one of the things I'm learning in podcasting is I feel like if I've covered a subject, then it's been covered, but people don't, <laughs> people start listening. They don't go back and listen to old episodes. Some well, do. And it, some and it's, do. You know, I mean, we answer, there's a lot of the same questions that keep coming up, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's new stuff too. Like there's always yeah. new products coming out and, you know, in, in the TRT world, there's always new stuff that, people are interested in so uh I, you know, I love talking about this stuff i do it all day if i could um so let's do it uh talk a little bit and, and like the first time the first go around we talked about this you talked uh about um kind of what drew you into strength training and what kind of what oh, ultimately yeah. led you on the path to your your undergraduate degree and then further yeah. interest in it in medicine so why don't you talk a little yeah. bit about that um yeah, gosh. I mean, I, I started, so I started lifting weights in high school and, you know, to be honest with you, it wasn't, I can't think of what drew me to it, but there, I was just one of those guys. Um, and I, you're the same way. And I know a lot of guys are as well that dude, as soon as I picked up that weight and I started lifting it, it just, I just felt like this is something I need to be doing. Like this just feels good. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was something in my DNA, but um, the minute I started, you know, it's, I knew that this was for me and that I was going to, I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life. And so, uh, yeah, I started lifting weights in high school, just like most high school kids I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, and then in college, you know, I obviously continued, um, uh, I continued lifting. I actually got into, um, I got into a little bit, a little bit into the com competitive powerlifting because I, you know, I started getting big. I started putting on a lot of muscle mass and I started getting pretty strong, like compared to my peers. And so, you know, when that happens, people, start noticing and they're like man you need to compete you need to compete <laughs> and you know a lot of it they were pushing me towards bodybuilding and i just was like dude i no, i you know i see what those guys do to get in that kind of shape yeah um, and it's brutal and you know obviously like the drugs use is pretty um it's brutal and i don't and it's and it's non-functional 
I mean, no, it's it really, yeah, it's, I mean, and, it, and it's honestly, something, that's at, something we don't like to talk about, but it really at is age, non-functional. At age 19 and 20, really, like, the big thing was, like, I didn't want to get into a, a, some yellow fluorescent speedos in front of <laughs> that too. 100 people, yeah. you know, like, yeah, yeah it just was like, yeah. not my thing. So I gravitated to a powerlifting where, you know, my diet involved eating more food, you know, right, so right. I would diet up, you know, yeah. and so, uh, you know, I like powerlifting a lot. I got into it. I got, you know, pretty good pretty good lifts out of it. Um, but there, you know, it, to me, the benefits of lifting were apparent immediately. Um, it improved my confidence, it improved my physique. I felt better. Um, I mean, I could just physically do stuff that other people couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And I could physically do stuff that I couldn't have done, you know, even a year or two before that. Um, so I don't know. It's, it, it's one of those things. I, it's, you know, you hear about it, certain athletes, like they, they pick up a, a, hockey, a hockey stick for the first time, or they mm-hmm. or baseball. They throw a baseball or a baseball hit a you know hit a baseball with a bat, and they just know that that's for them. That's yeah. how I felt with the weights. That's how I felt with the weights. And by the way, it was exactly the same thing with jujitsu. The first time I got choked out, I was like, I, I don't, I don't know what just happened, but like I, I have to know this. Like, I, <laughs> right. I don't know what I, this. I have to know. I have to learn this. Yeah. You know, and that was 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, I I, ha- I think I had a kind of a similar uh, kind of awakening to it. I didn't uh, obviously in, in elementary school you don't really do any organized physical activity, right? You might you know, you can play kickball or dodgeball uh, or you know flag football or or, or hoops or something like that. Yeah. Junior high school is you know then you start having gym class, but then it's right. it's not it's really geared towards you just kind of expending energy for 50 minutes. It's not, yeah. it's not and, structured. And get, it's not a fitness program. Presidential fitness. Yeah. Bag, or or those, that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. most of the presidential fitness yeah. bat, right. I remember the presidential fitness badge. From, <laughs> I don't think they have those anymore. Most of that was a combination of genetics. And if you had the type of parents who were making you do other stuff, because, right. you know, you had the sports dad, uh, you know, who, yeah. who wanted you to do something. And I, I played, I played little league baseball. Um, I ran as a, a seventh grader. I ran track in eighth grade was going to be my first year playing organized football. Mm-hmm. And in preparation for that, I had some friends who were a year older than me. Right. So they were going into their freshman year of high school and uh, you had summer session for the high school football kids really only concentrated on the varsity team, but the JV team was allowed to use the gym. These were typically evenings, right? right? Yep. And I, and I started going with them to lift weights. And like you, the idea that I can lift on this week, I lifted this amount. And then next week I lifted a little bit more. So I was like, Hey, you know, right. And I also, I I also found that I, Uh I I actually enjoyed Uh somehow uh, sadistically enjoyed that feeling of, soreness the next day dude exactly and, yeah. and you chase and i was chasing that all the time right because i right. knew I, okay i like this hurts but it hurts good right you know? right you, you somehow I, you knew that that was a i didn't good yeah thing. yeah yeah i didn't know yeah. why i didn't know what i was doing but i just somehow knew that like i just have i've done something good i've yeah. done something good for my body here yeah. so at, at what point uh you know as you know you being you know, personally living the lifestyle of a warrior athlete, right. Through, throughout your life. Um, and I didn't mention that, you know, that also you, you were an officer in the, in the United States air force as well. Yeah. Um, as a jujitsu practitioner, as somebody who always put strength training, uh, at the, at the core of, of his lifestyle, when did you first reach the point? Was it, was it as a warrior athlete, you reached the point that you realized that, um, the, te- the, the testosterone, uh, the inadequacy of testosterone and people needing a replacement issue, or was it as a physician seeing patients or was it a combination of both? What, how did, how did you arrive at that moment where you said, Hey, TRT yeah. testosterone replacement therapy is something I'm interested in, not only because I want to utilize it, but also as a physician and I want to mm-hmm. practice it. Well, it was, you know, it's just like with training and nutrition. Um, you know, it all started with me just wanting to be you know, to, to see, to, to be as healthy as I could be, to push my limits, to see what my, you know, genetic potential was. But in terms of testosterone, um, I noticed something um, in the, my mid to late thirties, maybe 36, 37, mm-hmm. that I, I could tell something wasn't right. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, my nutrition was really good. You know, at that point I was pretty educated on, on training. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd been lifting for a long time. I had a good amount of muscle mass. I had a low body fat percentage, mm-hmm. you know, relatively low, like, you know, sub 15, I was probably between 10 and 15% body fat. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't that I was sloppy or I had a bad lifestyle and I was working a lot of shifts in the ER, just, you know, like you and I were doing mm-hmm. and I was working nights, but, um, you know, my, my, um, libido was near zero. Mm-hmm. My, um, my drive to get up and do things, the motivation that I used to have, I've always been a super hard charging guy, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, you just can't stop me once I get going. Um, that just went out the window and I just was lethargic. Um, and I didn't, I just didn't feel good. I was sort of, I was going to the gym, I was spinning my wheels and I just knew okay, something's not right. I need to get this checked out. You know, and you know, by that point I've been a physician for a long time, you know? Mm-hmm. So I was like, I need to go get my testosterone levels checked. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, yeah, they, they were low. I was like, my total was right around my total was like just 300, like 305, yeah. something like wow. that. You know, which for a very fit 30, 38 year old guy at the time, you know, was, was low enough to be symptomatic. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'll cut to the chase. I ended up finding a doctor that would work with me. Um, I did some additional training at Cenogenics, um, as you know, and to learn more about it. Cause you know, I, I'm the kind of guy, if, I, if I'm going to start something new, I got to know everything about it. Mm-hmm. Like I, I need to be, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have to be an expert, but I need to be pretty well versed in stuff. Uh, I just have a curious mind that way. So I dove head first into TRT and age management originally for myself mm-hmm. because, you know, the other part of this too, and, and I know you, you and I have talked about this offline, but, you know, we, we took care of a lot of guys who have retired from active duty mm-hmm. um, or have maybe just retired or in the process of retiring and they have developed all of these health problems, blood yeah. pressure, diabetes or pre-diabetes. High, um, high cholesterol, you know, all of these issues, which, you know, 90% of which are lifestyle related. Mm-hmm. And I just thought to myself at 38, like, what am I going to, I don't want to be like those guys at 48 and 58, you know, that are on seven or eight different prescription drugs um, that, you know, they like have trouble tying their shoes, mm-hmm. that have erectile dysfunction. Like I, I want to be, I want to be in the top 5% in terms of health and what I can do. And I want to keep that. I want to ride that until the day I die, whatever that is, eighties, nineties, whatever, you know, it's not that I want to live forever. You know, I, I'd like to make it to 90, but I'd much, much rather make it. 104 to is my goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good goal. And you, yeah. you will make it. I'm sure you'll make it. <laughs> well, I, cause I said, if I said at 52, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I said, I feel like I'm halfway through. I feel like I can, I yeah. want to go. I, I want to, yeah. I want to do over on these 52 years again. So 104, you know, years. and that's the thing If you know, I, uh, I talk about this um, a lot to my patients and um, you know, and other podcasts and stuff, but you know, if, if you start this kind of thing early um, like an, what I mean is as a solid age management program mm-hmm. in you, you know, if you, ideally in your early thirties, if you start doing things right, you know, the earlier you do that, the longer you can potentially extend your, your life and, but more yeah. importantly, your health span. Right. So there's not much point in living to a hundred, right? Right. If, um, if you're in a wheelchair, you've got it and you have a catheter for the last 30 years of your life. Right. right. You know, and you're in chronic pain because you're hooked on opiates, you know, yeah. like, and, and you go to dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right. Which, you know, quite frankly, like how, how many of those guys do you and I see? Oh yeah. They're out there ba- on a <laughs> daily basis. Yeah. That's what I see in the ER and they're not a hundred. They're actually yeah. 60. Yeah. So they look, um, but they look a hundred, <laughs> they look a hundred and yeah. you, you know what? They probably feel like they're a hundred too. So, yeah. so anyway, I would see these, you know, I would see people going down that road and I was like, you know, um, I don't know what I have to do to not end up like that, but I have to find, I have to find out what it is. Cause I, I just don't want to be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to, that's not how I want to live my life. Um, and, um, you know, quite frankly, now I, I now that I've, kind of gotten a handle on that. I want to help other people also not go down that road. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned so. two things that I think are, are that I'd like to, I'd like to jump back and touch on. So um, the first of which in your, in your own personal journey and in the journey that we're describing with, you know, all these, these mm-hmm. active, you know, the life that I led, the guys that we see who've retired from active duty and they're, they've kind of, they've kind of burnt the candle at both ends for so long. Uh, 
one thing that is uh, unique about emergency medicine, of course, and you mentioned it is we work a lot of really work shift works, right? So yeah. you're like always, you're always battling your own cortisol level because you're, yeah. yeah, you're never getting enough sleep and you're always changing yeah. your sleep schedule. Your body doesn't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that, that is a huge contributor to just totally snuffing out your, your, uh, your endogenous testosterone production. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, circadian, and, circadian rhythm disruption is terrible. Yeah, and that's and, and that's why we see in all these operators, you know, guys mm-hmm. who did, you know, yep. I only, I did five deployments, and I say only five deployments. Only five. I, yeah, because yeah. I I know guys that have done yeah. 11, 16. And you know, we're talking about, you know, nine at least as a minimum 90 day blocks of time, yeah, where they were almost exclusively on nights. But of course, the enemy gets a vote on that too. So sometimes you end up on a 48 hour mission cycle. Yeah. All kinds of create. Then you come back home. You're getting. You're doing night training. Oh, we got to do. We got to. We got to uh, check off our night jumps. We got to check off our night range time. So you're, you're again. It's going. You know. You're getting alerted. Pagers going off. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. It, these are all things Plus. that are adding up. Adding up to burning yeah. yourself out. Adding to that, you know, these these are our, and I, you know, I talk about this in 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 my book is people that are emphasizing performance optimization instead of longevity optimization. So they're not they're, the same thing. They're not, not the same, the, thing. Not the same and, thing. Yeah. So they're, they're, yeah. they're, di- they're, they're damaging their body. They're, they're yeah. I, I like the, the, the phrase that I always use is they are sacrificing their body at the altar of mission accomplishment, right? Is there, and, and they're doing all these terrible things that's in the military aspect of them, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a huge segment, obviously of the, yeah. of uh, the audience of this show. But I think that's true. Even even if some even if it's we're talking about an IT guy, a car salesman, there are so many things in our modern society mm-hmm. that inadvertently are geared towards in they're they're directly responsible or indirectly responsible for causing this massive epidemic of low testosterone. Being in yeah. front of computer screens, not sleeping properly, not eating properly, eating too much processed food, eating the wrong foods. Um, what are you, what are you seeing as the common thread in your patient, in your patient population? Um, that all, if, of the if, above. all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. figured, I figured as much, yeah. cause you know, it's, yeah. uh, you know, I'm again, I'm, I'm the poster child probably for all of those things. Cause I did, yeah. I led the active lifestyle, burning myself out, yep. transitioning into the physician lifestyle where you're under fluorescent lighting, but working these stupid fucking hours all the time, yeah. burning yourself out. And, you, you know, I would have to, in your community, especially, you know, special operations, how many of those guys, um, you know, how many of them have had deep guys? You yes. Know, and lot. that's really underappreciated. It's totally how, underappreciated. how TBI yeah. uh, can affect you. And I, and I tell people, you know, when I describe this in layman's terms to people, I, I say, you know, this all boils down to when you get bonked on the head, mm-hmm. ima- imagine that you have two skulls, one skull that surrounds your brain popular. Pop, pop, proper Proper. and another little tiny skull that surrounds your pituitary gland yes only that one's a little bit tighter (laughs) so so when you take a ding on the head it's like you're literally gut punching your pituitary gland every time you take a blow to the head and what i see with that too you know it's guys the you know if first of all most of the time that goes totally unrecognized from an endocrine Mm -hmm. standpoint uh but you know they may because testosterone is in the news and you know, physicians are becoming a little bit more aware of it. Some of those guys, they, they will get their low testosterone picked up. But again, these guys have damaged their hypothalamus and the mm-hmm. pituitary gland. So, you know, they have issues with growth hormone. You know, mm-hmm. they have issues yeah. with cortisol, vasopressin, you know, all, all these other, you know, pituitary gland puts out more than just LH yeah. and FSH, right? right? It's busy. <laughs> so it's a, it's a busy little gland. So yeah. it's just important that they see an endocrinologist or somebody that understands, you know, the complexity of that. Um, and, you know, because they may get a little bit better if they have their, their testosterone corrected, but if they still have all these other issues, uh, you know, they, they may not, you know, get back to, to as healthy as they could be. Um, so anyway, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to digress too much on that. No, no. I think the TBI thing is really important. Um, guys are listening to this. If you've had a TBI, please, you know, get, get your hormones checked. You know, it's, it's easy to do. Yeah. T- you know, uh, TBI is, it's, some have described, you know, TBI as kind of this generation's Agent Orange. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which, uh, it, but but it really, if you think about, it, we have two, we actually have two because if if yeah. really the burn pits are kind of a little bit more yeah. our yeah. this generation's yeah. agent agent yeah. orange, but as far as the the absolute epidemical among the military, I think absolutely it's TBI because so many of us had our bell our bells rung in oh, yeah. various forms throughout yeah. our active duty career, yeah. and and we're and we're definitely seeing the results of that now. Yeah. I definitely you. You know, at least it's getting recognized. You know, yeah. they, you know, the guys that are veterans of prior conflicts, you know, Vietnam and before that, you know, the poor guys, they had TBIs too. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. Yeah. You know, and we, you know, we, we didn't, didn't know. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't know didn't. or didn't give a shit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It used to be, I mean, you know, back in the day, you thought a concussion was something you got one time and you yeah. felt a little woozy yeah. for Shake a couple of days. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then, yeah. but you were back at practice the next yeah. day. Yep. You, you mentioned specifically, and, and, and I want to talk about that later. So I'm, I'm making a, I'm, I'm marking this with a yellow post-it note so we don't okay. forget about, uh, about people picking out uh, endocrinologists and or people that are, you know, qualified yeah. uh, to, to yeah. do a complete diagnosis, not just throw a bottle of testosterone and everything. And we'll talk more yeah. about that later. Yeah. You mentioned specifically when you went in and you felt like shit, um, getting your levels checked. Yeah. And this is one of the most common questions I get. I get this as, a, as an Instagram comment, probably once every two weeks. Hey, yeah. doc, my levels are X. What should they right. be? What should so, they be? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so let's talk about that. Yeah. What, what levels? Let, let's talk about uh, total versus free yeah. and what you see, what the, uh, I'm, I'm making air quotes here, normal for age, because neither you and I necessarily believe yeah. in that. <laughs> yeah. But but let's talk about that. What What's what's normal? What's not normal? And what mm -hmm. what labs should people be asking yeah, their great, doctor to run? Great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's we'll talk about this, just testosterone specifically for a second, because uh, it's a really good question. It's, uh, you know, the norm as I'm sure guys are are listening to you and are familiar with this stuff that what is considered to be the normal range of testosterone is quite broad. Mm -hmm. I actually, I actually wrote it down here and it varies from assay to assay. Um, it depends on what lab you use, but mm -hmm. you know, currently lab core, they consider a total testosterone and this is in nanograms per deciliter. So mm -hmm. just make sure you guys look at the units cause you'll see other, other, um, other units being used, but mm -hmm. the nanograms per deciliter is what, what we use in the United States most of the time. That's what my brain, where if it's, if it's in nanomoles, I have to like do math and it hurts my head. <laughs> uh, so they what they consider to be normal is 264 mm -hmm. to 916. Okay. That's a huge range. So, right. That's but massive. There's, there's more to this. There's more to this story. So that's the, yeah. that's the, that's the normal range that LabCorp decided is normal for, for yeah. young men, for young yeah. men up to age 40. As of 2017, prior to 2017, it was 348 to 1197. Hmm. So you're like, well, why did they move the bell curve to the left? Well, if you dig a little bit, you can find out why. So I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna venture a guess. Yeah, let's hear it. You're, I'm that sure they're right. that like dumbasses. They're looking at what the average is. Right. They're not looking at what what should be the average. They're looking at what is the average. And they're just basically, it's like they're saying it, it almost like if they moved healthy BMI, if they said, ah, 35, you're fine. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Your fat ass is, is normal. So exactly. it's average. So, so it's normal. <laughs> this, this original number, this 348 to 1197 was based off of like the Framingham data. It was based off Framingham yeah. data from like the early 2000s. And it only included lean, healthy men, 18 to like 18 to 40, basically. So right. lean, this is the key. This is lean. Yeah. So they they are you know they justify this lowering by saying, well, well, basically like they didn't use these words, but it's like, well, this is a more inclusive sample that includes <laughs> right. includes men right. who are overweight. Right. Now, now they didn't they didn't put obese men, but again, they're using BMI as a standard, right? Mm -hmm. We know the issues with BMI. Right. So you can be this included men who are now overweight. Right. And if there's one thing that will lower your testosterone, um, it's, it's excess body fat. Yes, absolutely. Visceral body fat. Yeah. And you do not have to have a BMI over 30 to have that effect. You know, you can be one of these skinny fat guys mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. rocks around with 35% body fat, 
but only weighs 170 pounds. And you better believe that that 35% body fat has a negative effect on your testosterone. So there, you know, as, as you know, there, there has been a global decline in testosterone levels. It's been going on mm-hmm. for decades. Yep. It's, uh, it's mirrored with sperm counts. So men's mm-hmm. sperm counts since as long as they've been measuring them at least until the night since the 70s have been doing this yeah okay and testosterone and levels are you are guys can't see this but he's now. making he's making a line going down i'm making, <laughs> I'm making a line yeah going down so um so this is a pathological process right i think mm-hmm. we can all agree that this is not a good thing yeah all right so in my mind, why, why would you adjust what is considered to be normal? Or why would you normalize a pathological process? Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, what they should have done is they should have gathered up a bunch of healthy, jacked triathletes with body fats of 10% from mm-hmm. up to ages 18 to 40. And they should have, that's what they should have used as their norm population. You should be using a healthy population. You should not be using a diseased population Mm-hmm. to determine what your re- normal reference values are. No, you know what? I, I, I've, got an even, I've got an even simpler way, is they should have given a thousand men, just picked a thousand men at random, mm-hmm. given them all a spear. Those who can <laughs> kill a bear with a spear are the levels we're going to check. Right. Nobody, so else, that, nobody else gets checked. That's the poor man's, <laughs> poor man's testosterone level, right? right? Like if, if you can kill a bear, a bear with a spear, you don't need TRT. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, so that's but, normal. <laughs> right. But you see my point though, you yeah. know, it's, you know, it's the, the BMI analogy is a good one. And it's sort of like with women saying, you know, women are getting big or gaining weight, but you know, they still want to be a size eight. So, so we're going to make the dresses bigger, but we're going to keep the, the number eight size tag on it. Right. Right. You know, like, hey, hey yeah. honey, you're still a size eight. Don't worry. Yeah. Well, you know, it, you know what's, it, what, what this, this whole thing instantly reminded me of, this moving the goalpost thing instantly reminded me of, is, is when, when I wrote the nutrition chapter of my book, mm-hmm. uh, and you and I had had multiple conversations about how much protein somebody needs, right? And if you look in all of the, uh, if, if you just go to WebMD, or start poking around on the internet. The amount of protein that you and I say people need is is probably twice as high as what most people, especially yeah, over age sixty. Yeah, but you when you, you but again, more. when you poke around in the weeds on, well, why are they telling sixty year olds that they need less protein? Right. In the fine print, it's just because well, because they're not lifting weights. Exactly. And it's like, well, fucking make them lift weights. You should, you know, I'm, maybe I'm a little biased, but yeah, I, everybody, everybody should lift weights. Well, and that's, and, and I, I, I cite this, yeah. specifically cite the study in my book that mm-hmm. found that, uh, 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 elderly, elderly people who did lift weights, not only had a better quality of life, but could expect, and I think it, I want to say it was another five years of life. Mm-hmm. Like it was cardio protective and everything else. In addition to that, the person that lifted weights did better than the guy who goes out and runs 10 miles yep. every Saturday, you know, it, because yep. you know, muscle mass and overall fitness did have an impact on it. So, so there's a great quote by Mark, Rip, I think it's Mark Ripito. And he said, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of great Mark Ripito. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and this one's actually scientifically accurate. Uh, yeah. he, he said, it was something like, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's like, Strong people are harder to kill and more useful in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that totally but, sounds like a rip. But here's the thing: here's why I'm right. So, so I gave a lecture to, on this topic uh, a number of months ago at a conference. One of the biggest determinants, as if, if you're an older person and you suffer like a major health catastrophe, so you know, like grandpa comes in, you know, he's he's got urinary tract infection, he's septic, he ends up mm-hmm. on a ventilator for a week, mm-hmm. you know, critically ill, sick. Mm-hmm you know, or, or like grandma falls and breaks her hip. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest determinants of whether they will survive that and, mm-hmm. and return back to their previous level of function, or at least recover to the point where they can live independently mm-hmm. is muscle mass. Yeah. It's a number one thing. Yeah. It, it, it's so important. So if you go into a critical illness with a, with a good amount of muscle tissue, mm-hmm. you're more likely to come out the other end and be okay. If, if you come in and you're weak, frail, cachectic, obese, and mm-hmm. by the way, most obese elderly people are cachectic. And by cachectic, yeah. I mean they have scrawny muscles. Yeah. They're just, 
underneath all that fat, you know, you, there's that myth, right? That you know, if you're fat, you have to, you have bigger muscles because you have to carry this weight around. Right. It's completely false. Yeah. It's completely false. There's something called lipotoxicity uh, where all this excess adipose tissue actually atrophies muscle tissue. So, but regardless, um, it's those people that go into a critical illness like that with, with low amounts of muscle, just low amounts of skeletal muscle tissue, they do not mm -hmm. do well. You know, just, well. just from anecdotally, from my own experience, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm what, nine weeks out now yeah. from a, from a total hip replacement. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. four days later I got rid of the walker and I was walking with a cane. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, by the end of the third week, I was back in the gym doing, you know, certain, you know, right. uh, there's a reason for that. I, yeah, I did. I was, you know, traveling, traveling globally within a couple of months. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I can, you know, completely ditched the, you know, the cane probably at like the two month mark. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm back basically doing everything now. Do I, yep. does it feel a little bit different still? Well, yeah, but, but my recovery, you know, so far has yeah. been great. Because going into all this, and 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 really, I had I had some atrophy even before the surgery because I had uh, yeah. I was in Poland and Ukraine, and then I had a yeah. long period of time where where I was in so much pain I couldn't really work out adequately. But I'm glad what I did the 18 months previous to that, you know, really yeah. helped me in my recovery. Yeah. My my one of my favorite quotes, um, and I say it all the time, and I I can't remember where I heard it because otherwise I I give the person credit, but. It was, it was, they said, if, if you want to be good at 80, you cannot afford to be average at 50. Right. So you need to be awesome at 50. Right. Like if you want to be 80 years old and out on the golf course and um, playing with your grandkids and, you know, maybe hopefully still chasing your wife around the bedroom at age 80, man, you, you better, you have to be a kick-ass 50 year old. Yeah. Because we, we all know, again, you know, you and I see what the typical 80 year old who doesn't take care of themselves what that 80 year old looks like right but if you do things right and and especially by the time you're 50 if you know if you're jacked at 50 mm -hmm. you've got a good chance of having a pretty high quality of life still when you're 80 which really like in my mind that's what an age management program is all about it's like i'm i'm training for the last 10 years of my life right now mm -hmm. yeah because the last 10 years of my it. life i want to spend with my family I want to be traveling the world. I want to be spending money and, you know, having a good time. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be on 20 prescription drugs and have to go see my doctor, um, you know, every other month. And then I don't want to be in the ER twice a year for heart failure exacerbation, yeah. you know, yeah. um, which is pretty much the norm. You know, like yeah. that's what I see every day. So I'm like, I don't want to be that guy. So, you know, I, I turned 59 in a month or sorry, it's 59, 49 in a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, I'm, I'm knocking on 50, you're obviously after 50, um, but I'm trying to set myself up right now to be a kick-ass 80-year-old, mm -hmm. like still on the mat doing jujitsu at 80. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that's that long range approach that I try to encourage guys to take. Every, you know, everybody, all the guys, they want the, they want the juice, right? They want to get on TRT, they want to, and I get it, they want to feel better. But um, many of them have this short range approach. One, they think testosterone is going to fix all their problems. And it's not right. Um, you know, and it's, it, it's certainly not a, um, it's not a shortcut to get anywhere. Right. You, know, you still have to do the nutrition, the training, all of the lifestyle stuff is, it's just as important on TRT as not. So um, I, you know, in my patients, like I, I tell them I'm not a TRT doctor, I'm an age management doctor. And I, I, I do my best to change their perspective from a short range one. We obviously, I set short range goals for my patients. Mm -hmm. We work on that, but I want them to have a 30 year downrange perspective on this. When you start TRT, you're not just starting TRT. Like mm -hmm. you, you, you are starting a lifestyle, uh, long range health promoting project, you know, a mega project mm -hmm. that is going to, that you need to be thinking about every single day for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I tell guys like, it, it's a grind, like doing, you know, being on a good age management program, like you and I are, it's not, it's not sexy, right? Like I, no. I, was, up at, I was up at five today. I've already been to the gym. I had my workout in, um, you know, and I'm sure you have too. Yep. It's eating, it's making the, you know, eating the food that you're supposed to eat and not, yeah. you know, eating the, the crap that you want to <laughs> yeah. eat. You know, I, yes. I like crap food just like anybody else, but 
I, I, tr- I do my best not to eat it because it's not compatible with my goals. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's not fun, but yeah. you know what? like I have a long range goal, you know, in mind. So, so I just do these things every single day, even though my body's telling me to do something else. I'm mm-hmm. like, no, fuck you. I'm not going to eat the tiramisu. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drink the protein shake and have the steak yeah. instead. No, that's, you know what? Uh, it's, the, I mean, today's we're recording this on a Sunday. I went out to eat. Denise and I went out to eat uh, yeah. Friday night. We went to Longhorn yeah. Steakhouse. I got uh, I got the six ounce mm-hmm. fillet. Okay, because yeah. that's that's a good piece of meat. Yeah, and it and Perfect. it's it's not. I love a ribeye, but let's yeah. be honest, a ribeye has a little bit too much. That's a, that's a special occasion for me. Yeah, because yeah. of the amount of fat that it has on it. Right. The yeah, the six true. ounce fillet. I got the six ounce fillet mm-hmm. and the Brussels sprouts. Perfect. Fucking yeah. delicious meal, yeah. right? Yeah. I was, you yeah. know, I was, I was, I met all of my calorie and mm-hmm. macro goals for that day yeah. because, you know, chock full of protein. I'm getting plenty yeah. of iron, everything else. Today was Sunday. I did a 30 minute hit routine in the garage. Then I went and jumped on my mountain bike for 20 mm-hmm. minutes so I could yeah. get outside, you know, energize my vitamin D, yeah. get out, get out, get out and enjoy the outdoors a little bit. Did that as my cool down. Mm-hmm. And my, my dinner tonight was me weighing out my, my rotisserie chicken salad right. on a scale, on a food scale, right. yeah. not just shoveling it down my gullet. Right. Cause I mean, most people don't understand the yeah. difference between sadie, like I've had enough to eat and oh, right. full, yeah. like, like I need to undo the button. And, and what, and a, yeah. and a thing that I tell people too, is what you, what you really don't understand is you need to eat. And even if you think you're still hungry, you need to wait 10 minutes. Oh, totally. Yeah. Because yeah, and, and that was that's that was the people don't realize that was the whole thing. The reason yeah. fast food became fast was they found out if people are shoveling, if, if there's an atmosphere that makes you feel like you're in a hurry, you'll eat more yeah. because you don't know when you've yeah. eaten enough. That's the why you I go to McDonald's too. and it's not until you're two miles down the road in the car that you go, fuck, I ate too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get the what are they, they got the McGurgles, the McBurgles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, that, and that's a great, yeah, you know, it's a totally great point. I tell guys, drink a, drink an eight ounce big glass of water before you sit down to your meal. Yeah. It, it yeah. accomplishes the same thing, right? Yeah. You're, 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 you will, you will definitely eat less. Yeah. There's all these little tricks that you can do, but you the can, hard part. Another, you know, another little, another little trick. And I actually learned this on the Sopranos is, <laughs> uh, it must be good. Yeah. A little bit of sugar. Yeah. Just a little bit of, of, sh- of refined sugar, or it doesn't even have to be, it can be fructose, like half a banana mm-hmm. after a meal, that little carb hit makes mm-hmm. you feel like, I didn't feel full yeah. with everything else, but now I, I got a little bit of a carb hit and now yeah. I feel full. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. 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 So totally. when somebody decides, yeah. uh, when somebody decides that, uh, Hey, I'm, I'm whatever age I'm in my thirties or whatever. Don't have the energy that I had before. Mm-hmm. It's harder to work out my, uh, I don't, I'm not satisfied with the way my dick's working, whatever their, their case happens to be. And they need to go and, and they need to get labs checked. Yeah. What labs should they be getting checked? Okay. Um, before they go do their labs, if they're, if they're entertaining testosterone, I, I usually recommend guys do one of two, preferably both, uh, of one of the commonly used testosterone screening questionnaires. Mm-hmm. The, the most common one that uh, I think the urologists mostly use, it, it's the Adam questionnaire. Which, which is, know. yeah, which is what I did. That's when yep. I first got started. Yeah. Yep. And then the other one is the aging male symptoms in a score, which is a much more comprehensive one. Um, I, I tend to like that one better. And I like to, I like to guys to have, I like them to do a baseline on that. And then mm-hmm. if they end up being treated with testosterone, it's, it's kind of nice to like repeat that in six months and just mm. show them like, wow, dude, look how much better you've gotten on all. Do you, numbers. uh, is that, a, is that a numerical? Is it a visual analog? How does it work? Yeah, it's, it's numerical. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I'll send you a link and maybe you, you can post it for the guys. But yeah. What, what I could see the utility in that, especially as long, especially in as long as, they don't mm-hmm. remember it. And the, you know, the placebo, if, that's why I like, I, 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 we're getting into a scientific rabbit hole here that people are going to go, what? Yeah. That's what I actually like uh, for follow-ups. If, if it's a, if it's a questionnaire that I know I'm going to give a follow-up to, I like yeah. visual analog a little bit better. Yeah. 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 And for those of you who have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, 
Don't worry, because you're never going to need to know. <laughs> but these two questionnaires, so if you're going to go talk, let's say you're going to talk to your doctor about getting your testosterone checked. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, most docs are cool with that. Um, I, I've still been surprised. Though. I've had some buddies tell me that, yeah, my doctor refused to, to check it. I'm like, I've heard that before, too. So I've total, like, I have totally like, heard that. You have a right to know what your levels yeah. are. You mm-hmm. know, honestly, if a patient wants a blood test, and especially if they're paying for it, you know, and, and luckily these days, so you can go online and you can order all your own blood work. There's a number yeah. of these companies that do that. So you can actually bypass your doctor. But l- l- let's say you're going to go to your doctor and you're going to you're going to have that discussion about blood work and testosterone. I tell mm-hmm. guys in my book to uh, bring do those questions come armed. Mm-hmm. OK, with those two questionnaires filled out. OK, and show them to your doctor because depending on what your special doctor specialty is and what their background is, they may never have heard of these. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that, that instead of, you know, them shutting you down right away, you can be like, look, Hey, I took these two validated questionnaires. They look, my score says it's suspicious for possibly testosterone, you know, a, a suboptimal testosterone level. And then now, usually that, w- that'll get you to get it done. Would you say if, you know, I'm, I'm just some guy, I do exactly what you're talking about. I, I, take both of those questionnaires, I print them out, I take them into my doctor. My doctor looks at these things like he's looking at Sanskrit. He has no idea what he's looking at. Have I effectively ruled out him as being, him or her as being an adequate provider to now take care of my problem? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Well, let's put it this way. So you you haven't ruled them out as the guy that can sign the lab slip for you to get the blood. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So So don't walk it. Don't walk out of the office immediately. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, one of the things I tell guys, I, and I get emphasized in my book, do not be a dick to your doctor. Do, right. If they don't know anything about testosterone. That's not, uh, that's not their fault. That's not their fault. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? It's not their job. Yeah. You know, the, an, inter, an internist or a family medicine doc, they're, they have no training in testosterone. They're there to take care of grandpa's heart failure and mm-hmm. his diabetes. And they're very good at that. And so if you come in there with an attitude, dude, I mean, you're not going to get you're not going to get what you want. You just, yeah. so, so, you know, it's like number one rule of life, right? Just, just don't be a dick. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, so that doctor probably is not going to, you know, th- this is what typically happens that I've seen with my buddies. They'll go in, they'll see their family doc. They're very uncomfortable with testosterone. There, there is, there is still to this day, like I call it t- testosterone phobia in the mainstream medical world. And um, there's just a lot of misunderstandings about it. A lot of it is, is like a holdover from the bodybuilding, like steroid era, Right. Where, you know, they still think it causes prostate cancer. They still mm-hmm. think it, it, it accelerates heart disease. It causes blood clots. All, all of, you know, all these things have been proven to not be true, mm-hmm. but you know how it is. It takes a long time for stuff to percolate into the, the medical body of knowledge, you know, for your average Joe doctor, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, so anyway, just, you know, you just got to keep that in mind. Um, so I'm not sure where we're going with that, but um <laughs> But, but they, you know, they typically will be very uncomfortable with that. They'll order the test. Let's say it comes back low, you know, we'll we'll talk about what, you know, what low is, what they'll typically do is refer you to an endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing. So testosterone phobia um, is, 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 uh, let's say endocrinologists are not immune to testosterone phobia. Sure. Uh, neither, well. neither are your urologists in my No, they're, they're not, you know, they're not, and I'm not bashing them at all. Cause it, you know, it varies. I, I've, I've met providers from both of those specialties that are extremely knowledgeable about testosterone. And I've met, there's one in this town who is just, she's horrible. Um, and just like, where I think she just wants all men to be castrated. She just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I don't want to digress on that too much, but so when you see an endocrinologist, what, what they will do is they'll follow the Endocrine Society guidelines. Um, and the Endocrine Society guidelines are for the treatment of hypogonadism, okay, mm-hmm. which is a very specific diagnosis. It requires a very low testosterone level. And in the guy, if you, in, guys can pull up the guidelines if you want to read them. Um, and they, they, they say basically you have to have an unequivocally low testosterone level. And what they mean by that is below the current standard reference range. So less than 264. Wow. Okay. Okay. You need to have that not just once, but you need to have it twice. Okay. And the reason, well, we'll talk, I'll talk, I'll tell you the reason. Uh, I know what, I know one of the reasons is, I, 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 I'm going to guess that because 
if you go to a Reddit forum, it'll <laughs> tell you how to drive your testosterone. Yeah, down I, know, and I, know. It, yeah. I know, dude. I've had guys yeah. ask me about that. I'm like, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, there, there is this diurnal, they call it diurnal variation of testosterone. Yeah. Your yeah. levels will be higher in the morning. They tend to be lower in the afternoon. Um, what a lot of docs don't know is that after about the age of 60, that kind of goes away. So mm -hmm. your levels in the morning are not that much different, but you know, I, in a young guy, I've seen a difference of 150 points. Wow. Um, That's pretty know, significant. Between, yeah. Between like 3 PM and like 9 AM. So they want it done twice and they want you to be low on both of those. And they want it done before 10 AM. Um, oh, okay. by the way, they also want it fasting now. That's a new thing. So because hmm. when you fast, your testosterone level is higher. Ah. So here's the problem with that. You know, it's not like, it's not like, you, so you got a guy, let, let's we'll use me as an example. Like I'm 38. I had all the symptoms. I, by the way, my Adam score and my aging male symptom score, like I had checked every box. It was, mm -hmm. I lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. So did I. So, oh, my Adam score. Um, and you know what? When I woke up first thing in the morning, I felt like shit. And when I went to bed at night, I felt like shit. And for every hour in between those two, I can, I felt like shit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not like, you know, at 10 AM it's Cinderella and like the carriage turns into a pumpkin, mm -hmm. you know, and that's when your symptoms start, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the fasting thing, you know, men don't live their lives fasting. Right. You know? and, and so I, I don't understand the point, you know, men don't live fasting and they live most of their lives after 10 AM. Mm -hmm. in the morning. So to me, these are just excuses. These are barriers to entry that have been put in place by well-meaning, well-meaning physicians. And I'm not going to say there's a conspiracy about it, but you know, these are, these are barriers to their, their excuses not to treat men. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can come in and maybe one of your levels is 250, but the next day it's 350. Mm, yeah. Sorry. You don't qualify for testosterone therapy, but you're like, but doctor, I, I have ED. I can't concentrate. Um, my wife's going to leave me because I have no libido. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't, I don't have the motivation to get up and exercise. I've, I have all these medical, I have insulin resistance, high triglycerides, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You know, you, your, your numbers say you don't qualify for therapy. So, so that's my beef with the endocrine society guidelines for hypogonadism. Um, so just be aware that that's sometimes what you'll run into. If you see uh, a mainstream physician or endocrinologist. Now, that's not always the case. So I don't want to paint a bad picture about endocrinologists. Um, the way that I approach testosterone therapy and the way that um, a lot of docs do, in fact, I'm, I'm not that long ago, met a urologist up at the, he, he practiced at the University of Washington, a, like really well-renowned researcher and, um, you know, a place where a lot of urological research gets done. And those guys, you know, they understand testosterone. So my approach to it is, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for obviously men who have hypogonadism, you know, need to be treated. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of men who perhaps by numbers do not meet the diagnosis of hypogonadism, but they have a whole complex of symptoms and or they have one or more medical conditions that stand to benefit from a higher amount of testosterone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, you know, the list of those is, is extremely long. Um, and, and so, those people, you know, to deny them therapy, in my opinion, because they have a number on a piece of paper on two given days that is above or, you know, is, is above what, you know, a consensus of endocrinology guys said, you know, a few years ago, I, I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you have to, you have to treat patients individually. We all have, you know, slightly different physiology. And, you know, quite frankly, like the level at which I'm going to be optimally healthy in terms of my testosterone, it's, it might be different than yours. Um, and that has everything to do with genetic differences in the androgen receptor. Yeah. Um, some people have a very sensitive androgen receptor. So it, it doesn't happen very often, but I have ha I've seen guys with really like objectively hypogonadal levels of testosterone, like 250. Um, and, you know, they they came to see me because their number was low, but I run through these checklists with them, these aging male symptom scores. I, I asked them a lot of questions. Do you have ED? No. How's your libido? It's great. How's your energy? Great. I work out every day. Um, you know, I, I run through the whole thing and I'm like, how is this possible? Well, you know, 
I'm assuming that they are like the, the, the Prius, the hybrid of testosterone, mm -hmm. and they have a very sensitive receptor. They don't need very much testosterone in order to be optimally healthy. So you know what? Those guys, I don't care what their number is. They don't need TRT. Yeah. Now, is this, is, is this where we run into... So I remember uh, back when I first got put on TRT, mm -hmm. my, and I don't remember my numbers, but I remember my total testosterone, it was on the low end, but it was still in the bracket of what was to be considered normal. Right. My free testosterone is what was in the toilet. Right. And that, that does not get checked. Like it needs to be routinely. It needs to be, that's extremely important when you go and get your testosterone level checked, please get a free testosterone with it. And for you guys that are not aware so the free testosterone is the amount of testosterone that's in your blood that is unbound to various proteins, specifically albumin and SHBG. Okay. Mm -hmm. And those, that's a whole different talk on itself, but the, let's say your level, your total is 700. You're, you're not using 700, right? You know, you're using, if you're lucky, you're losing like 2% of that, mm -hmm. you know, 1% of that, that's your free. So that's the, that's the testosterone that is in your bloodstream dissolved. And it can, it can diffuse across the cell membrane and it gets into the nucleus and it binds onto the testosterone receptor and does its thing. Yeah. So yeah. you're absolutely right. So this is where some guys get, they get missed or, or I should say doctors miss an opportunity to help these men mm -hmm. because they'll come in with a total of say 500 and they've got all the symptoms and the doc's like, dude, you're 500. Like what it's, whatever this is, it's not a testosterone problem. Mm -hmm. But if they had taken the time, or if they knew a little bit more and they checked their free testosterone and they saw that it was completely bound, um, then, and it, and it was, it was low, their free was low. Okay. Well, you know, m maybe this person would benefit from a higher free testosterone. I, mm -hmm. You know, I, I never promise guys that they will, but I, I say, okay, we can, we can talk about this. We can explore right. that as a possibility. Right. The other thing that happens too, and I, I just want to just say this cause I think it's important. Um, when guys do these questionnaires, you'll see the questions on there. Um, and if you want, I can read a couple of them here. Yeah, yeah. So the guys can know. I, I think we did this on a, on a prior show, but let me get my mouse active here. We'll just do the Adam one real quick because it's quick and easy. But it says, do you have a decrease in libido? Do you have a lack of energy? Do you have a decrease in strength and or endurance? Have you lost height? Have you noticed a decrease in, quote, enjoyment of life? Are you sad and or grumpy? Are your erections less strong? Have you noticed the deterioration in your ability to play sports? Are you falling asleep after dinner? I remember um, that one specifically. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was me. That's yeah. that, me so, too. That's a really me common too. one, actually. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is: Has there been a recent deterioration in your work performance? So, dude, those are non-specific, right? Like a thyroid problem could do that. Mm -hmm. um, a shitty lifestyle and terrible diet and night shift work will do that to you. Mm -hmm. So just because you're positive on those screening tests, that doesn't mean you have low testosterone. What, no, what it means is you should 90, check it. 90% of most paramedics I know mm -hmm. would be positive on those. <laughs> probably, yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? Probably 90% of most ER physicians yeah. Yeah. or hospital. Definitely I, residents. I, I re <laughs> oh, God, yeah. 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 Sure. Um, ICU docs, like anybody that's in a stressful profession like we are probably is going to have this, but that doesn't mean they have low testosterone. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it also doesn't necessarily mean that they'll benefit from testosterone. And that's, you know, I, I'm very clear about that before I start a man on testosterone. Um, even if they're quite low, I, like, I don't, I don't make, I don't have a crystal ball. Like mm -hmm. I, I have seen guys with objectively low levels that I have brought well into the healthy normal range and got, they felt no different. Mm. None. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens. And so we discontinued testosterone. I mean, that, that clearly is not the problem. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time it's a lifestyle thing, honestly. Yeah. Um, and that's why like, you know, the guys, the small number of guys that are in my practice, like I beat them over the head. You need to be going to the gym. You need to be eating right. You know, I'm almost at the point where I'm like, send me pictures of your food. I want to yeah. see what you're eating. <laughs> you know, I'm not quite that bad, <laughs> right. but, um, but you know, um, you've got to do all this other stuff. And quite frankly, like if you, if you do some of these lifestyle things, and in particular, if you get your body, body fat is, we could do, we should probably do a whole other podcast on body fat. It, it, there's no quicker way to kill your testosterone levels than just mm -hmm. get, just get morbidly obese. Yeah. Okay. And the other th the thing is that you don't have to be that obese 
to have your testosterone levels be affected. So I always ask this, do you know what the, what the optimal level of body fat is for testosterone? And this is sort uh, of evidence based. I've only seen one study on this, but I'm going to say, it, it uh, like what, what would be the, you know, below which it's too low, you know, it starts because, you know, like if your body, if you're too lean, if you diet, you're yeah. too lean, you, your levels go down. Yeah. And then if you're above a certain point, you're, you're, you get too fat and you're, I know, I know when, when I get below 10%, yeah, I, I start to not feel good. I start to feel like yeah. I'm catabolic you know all the time. So yeah. there, there's one study in particular, I'm thinking of, it was 11%. Okay. The 11%. So I tell guys 10, just shoot for 10, 10 to 15%, which you know what, these days that's lean, dude. And oh and yeah, that's, that's look, I'm considered, I'm considered fit right now. And right. I'm, I'm walking around at about 25%. My love handles yeah. aren't that big. You can still right. see the vascular in my arms, but it's all, it's visceral. When, when I put the weight back on yeah, yeah. after surgery, it was yeah. pretty much all visceral. So if you and did, a, if you did a scan on me, my fucking yeah. momentum is fat and happy right now. I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, that puts you at higher risk for, yeah. for, you know, other issues down the road. And that's mm -hmm. a genetic thing, you know, yeah. the, the, the way you distribute your body fat. But, um, you know, I say that because there are a lot of guys walking around at 20% body fat, 25% body fat. And they're like, I'm you know, looking at themselves with their little dad bods and yeah. thinking but they're, good. they're also <laughs> making the mistake of they're comparing themselves to others. They are. They're not but, comparing but, themselves to what's optimal. Correct. Yeah. And, that, and that's my point is that they, they think they're doing okay, mm -hmm. but they're not. Right. You know, like, like if, especially if you, if you want to optimize your testosterone level, I'm sorry, but like yeah. 22%. Is not okay. Yeah, and I, I didn't make that law. It's not Andrew's rule. Yeah. It's just that's mother nature. <laughs> you know, you know? It, year, you get lean. year years ago, I made the comment. I, I said, and it, it was completely in jest, but I had just finished doing something. It was me, Shane Steiner, Tim Kennedy. Uh, I don't even remember who else was there, but I said, "Man, my fucking self esteem sucks. I got to find fatter friends." <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You need to, you need to <laughs> yeah. hang out with. Less studly man. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need, I need some yeah. self image help here. So. That's, a, that's, a, that's a rough crowd. Yeah. Well, that's and there's, and honestly, there's people yeah. that on a subconscious level, there's people that do that. Oh, oh I know they do. There's people but, that hang, hang out with smokers. So they don't feel bad about smoking. They continue well, to and, hang out with drinkers and fat yeah. people because we, you know, they want to feel good about where, themselves. Yeah. We've both seen it where one, one person tries couples, to like, yeah, couples, they try to get fit and yeah. they, they're either their partner or their circle of friends start to sabotage them. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, yeah. you don't need to do that. I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, what, no. oh, what do you think you're going to be a triathlete now? Oh, you don't need to do yeah, that. Exactly. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, you know, I, I, I hang out with a bunch of my geek friends and, and, you know, they eat terribly and, and it's a big joke of like, Hey, let's, let's slide the, the milk dud bag or the Costco milk duds, you know, over to Andrews. Mm -hmm. I know I like milk duds. And I was like, dude, like, I'm not going to eat that. Right. Like, and I'm just not, I mean, I want to, but I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So you just have to yeah. make that decision. No, but we're, we're body in, fat yeah. regulation is, is so important. It's, yeah. um, it's the one thing you could do for yourself to get your testosterone level in check yeah. <laughs> is get your body you want, fat down. You want to be in the D and D club that, uh, your hit score is also how many burpees you have to do. Yeah. That's yeah, the that's, D, that's the D and D club you want to be in. <laughs> not, <laughs> Not the one where you're just shoveling Cheetos in your mouth. You're playing a lot of solo, <laughs> a lot of solo D and D. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, I went to so, Gen Con years ago because I, I am a nerd, and um, this is many years ago, and it, it was horrifying. It, yeah. It, the, the and and I truly mean like it was actually sad, you know, yeah. to see these guys in their twenties, um, who were like four hundred to five hundred pounds. Yeah. Uh, in their twenties, you know, yeah. and and it's sad because it's like. I know you don't feel good. You can't feel mm -hmm. good at that. But I'm like, you have no idea what's waiting for you. Yeah. You have no yeah. idea what's waiting for you in the next 10 years. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you can talk to people like that, but you know, it, they're extremely resistant. Yeah. Um, and it's sad. Cause like, you know, as a doc, like you do, you want to help everybody. Yeah. Um, and when you've, you've stumbled upon things that you know will help and, you know, have helped you and, you know, help other people, you know, you want to share that, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are just not open to it. So yeah, no, this kind of a lifestyle, I, you know, it's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, 
but mm-hmm. that's the way it is. You know, back in 2010, it's funny you mentioned that. It reminded me of uh, something that happened in my personal life. Denise and I went to the New York City Food and Wine Festival, mm-hmm. which is put on by the Food Network. And it's over four days and you get to, you pick and choose. Uh, it's not like all held in like one big hall or anything. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's at spots all around town. And there's, and you have to buy separate tickets for all the different events. And it's impossible to go to, some of the events are actually going on at the same time. So you can't go to all yeah. the events, right? You got to pick and choose. Yeah. And the, and the, the smart play is uh, you do a couple of brunch events and then you do a dinner event. Never, what I advise people to do, if you're ever going to do something like that, don't even do, don't do even do two events in a day. Cause you're just going to feel too gluttonous. Like if you do a good brunch event, you're not going to want to go do that dinner event. Yeah. So, so we actually did uh, a Friday brunch event, Saturday brunch event and a Sunday dinner event is the, is a way that we did it. But there was, I still remember this man. There was most of the people there were people that you could tell really took care of themselves. And this is, and it's not cheap, you know, so they're pretty, they're pretty well to do. Right. Um, And this was a, you know, this is a, this is a vacation. This is a splurge weekend for us. I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it too much. And I, I'm just, I'm gonna, not going to go crazy, but I'm going to enjoy it. And almost all these events have open bar as well, by the way. Of course. But there was, there was one lady that was there, I remember, and she was the morbidly obese in the scooter with the 32-ounce soda in the front yeah. basket of the scooter yep. everywhere she went. Yep. And it's like, you're, 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 you're like, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. But I, you know, I know that I'm going to go, you know, next week, I'm going to be back in the gym and I'm going to be yeah. watching what I eat. Yeah. Because I don't want to end up like that. Yeah. You know? I feel bad for that lady. I mean, I, I do really too. Do. I do too. Um, and know, and I, I don't, I don't see how she could have gotten the enjoyment out of it that we did, you know, because, you know, no. you know, it, things like that are always better when it's like, this isn't something I eat all the time. I don't yeah. indulge like this all the time. Yeah. You know, well, exactly. You know, and, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, I don't put myself in her shoes, but you become accustomed to a, to a lower quality of life. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, you know, it's just like with like people with engine or COPD that we see, mm-hmm. you know, they, they dial down their activity. So they're not short of breath anymore or they're mm-hmm. not having chest pain anymore. And so when you ask them like, Hey, in your daily life, like you, you still getting chest pain or, Oh no, I don't, I don't get chest pain anymore. Yeah. It's not because I don't play better. golf anymore or anything else. Yeah. Exactly. Like I, I, I don't, I let my grand, I, I don't go up the stairs anymore. So mm-hmm. they, they dial back, you know, and that's, again, that's gets back to like age management um, at 80. I don't want to be dialing anything back. Mm-hmm. I re- realistically, I will. I mean, I've already had to dial back stuff because of orthopedic stuff and, mm-hmm. you know, and I have, I have no intention of stopping my physical regimen, you know, uh, anytime soon. So I, I know I'm going to pick up additional injuries and stuff like that, but I, I just refuse to go down that road. I, I don't, I'm the only way I'll end up in a scooter is if I'm a quadriplegic from mm. jiu-jitsu, you know, or an accident, yeah, I feel the same. You know, yeah. Or, you know, it, it's just, it, it will never be because of obesity. Yeah. You know, I just, um, I just refuse. You, yeah. you know, you, life is short. You only go around once. Uh, that we know of, and um, you got to make the most of it. Absolutely, but that's hard yeah. work. It's hard yeah. work. Yeah, you know, it's like but it's worth it. It's worth it, it though. It, it really it is. is. It is worth it, you know. But it's hard convincing other people that it's yeah. worth it. Yeah. yeah. So so the daily well, thing. So a guy listening to this podcast, and you know, already looking up, you know, to do these surveys online, already planning on going in to see uh, mm-hmm. his physician. What? Uh, any physician that he goes to, whether it's his existing PCP or somebody yeah. else, what type of qualifications and knowledge base should the layperson be looking for in a physician to manage them properly? Good question. So for, yeah, for testosterone. So this gets back to, um, so in the, in the mainstream medical world, meaning, you know, four years of med school, three to six years of residency and a standard approved residency program, the only specialty, the only two specialties really that have formal training as part of their residencies in, to, in any sort of testosterone therapy at all is, and obviously endocrinology. So they, they do a fellowship in endocrinology. They do an internal medicine residency and then 
um, endocrinology uh, fellowship, and then obviously urologists deal with it too, and then andrologists, which are just a subspecialty of, of urologists. Outside of that, um, if you know, basically a physician in any other specialty, and this includes me, you have to pursue additional training. Uh, because, you know, so I'm double boarded, right? I did, I did a full family medicine residency. I did a full ER residency. You know how many lectures I got on testosterone? Pumpkins. <laughs> right. Pumpkins, yeah. right? Zero. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm saying like, you can't be mad at your primary care doctor for not knowing how to manage your testosterone. It's like, that, that's not part of their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are a number of different certifications that doctors can get. Um, you know, you and I just talked with one, about one offline, but it, it's totally okay to ask your doctor, Hey, where did you learn how to manage people on testosterone? You know? And, and if they're like, well, I, you know, if they say Reddit, <laughs> you know, or, right, right. you know, or they, or they give you a bro science forum, which they won't, right. um, you know, maybe that's a little bit of a red flag or they're right. like, oh, I just picked it up along the way. Mm, that could be a red flag, you know, it may not be, um, you know, if you're smart, you can pick things up along the way if you have good mm -hmm. mentors, but um, ask them if they have formal training in it. If they, mm -hmm. how, how many CME credits have you done in, in, in male, you know, testosterone replacement, androgen mm -hmm. therapy, et cetera. And, you know, any doctor, you know, I, I, they should not be offended by that. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not offended when people ask me my credentials. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Uh, no, you, they, you, re they rarely do for some reason. Yeah. I, I would think that they would, but nobody ever asked me, you mm -hmm. know, but I'm happy to share them. And so, um, you know, I think it's okay to ask your doctor, Hey, wh where did you learn how to do this? Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, there, there's probably about half a dozen major medical organizations out there that provide formal training for doctors. Um, it's very expensive. You know, mm -hmm. we've talked about some of the prices, but, um, and so uh, maybe the, you know, that deters a lot of doctors. Um, it's especially important to ask that question. And again, this is not, I'm not going to bash mid levels here, but if, if your testosterone provider is a PA uh, or a nurse practitioner, um, I think it's well within your rights to ask them what's your certification, you know, in this particular field, yeah. because um, you know, they, they do two years of training. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, this, this is from my personal, okay. my personal yeah. experience, a lot yeah. of the mid levels out there doing it basically yeah. did like an apprenticeship type thing. Mm -hmm. They okay. they got they got hired by one of these men's clinics or something like that. Yes, they yeah. ran them through a little two day yeah. course, mm -hmm. and then they are uh, co signing their charts for the first month. Correct, correct. And they're they get away with that because they're doing cookbook medicine, right? It's correct. it's algorithmic medicine. Right. You know, it's, you know, this is I'm going to prescribe this and then this and then this and then I'm going to check this and this and this, uh, which, hey, you know what, for maybe 70, 80 percent of the people out there, that's probably going to work. Yeah, it's I mean, probably going to work. Let's face it, like like TRT, it's not rocket science. Right. Okay. Right. This is not it's not that difficult. Like there are right. some pitfalls <laughs> in, in a in a reasonably in a healthy young man. Right. Where you probably want to have a doctor, though, is. Hey, now you've got a guy with low testosterone. Oh, by the way, he gets dialysis three days a week. He's mm -hmm. had three MIs. He's got a stent. Um, he's got you know heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and he's on these twelve different medicines. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now all of a sudden, you know your two years of training, you might be a little bit uh, underwater on that. Right, you, right. Not necessarily because again, I it's highly variable. I know some really good PAs that could handle that no problem, but. Um, you know, the, just, you know, having a doctor that's had seven to 10 years of training in, in conventional sick care still has its advantages. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have one of these sick care problems that you're bringing to the low testosterone picture, mm -hmm. if you're an otherwise healthy guy, it's probably fine. You know, yeah. you can see a nurse practitioner or a PA, but um, again, you, you should ask them, where did you get your training? Mm -hmm. You know, and they shouldn't, and if they get offended by that, that's kind of a red flag to me. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I would totally, I, I would feel exactly the same. You know, that's not, yeah. uh, and really that applies to anything. I don't think, uh, I, I, this is something that I told people a long time ago. I said, if you, if you ask your doctor where they went to medical school and they're either evasive or they say, why? Yeah. <laughs> they went to it. Then they went to it. They went to a yeah. shitty medical school. <laughs> yeah. Before I went under, I went, I had torn my ACL. I went in for knee surgery and, um, uh, 
you know, the, my orthopedic surgeon was like in his late fifties, like high experiences. And I'm like, you have done this before, right? <laughs> 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 He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, asshole. <laughs> but, you, know, it's, you know, you should ask. And again, it, it, it's a red flag to me if someone gets butthurt, you know, because yeah. you ask them, um, how long, how long have you been doing this? Where did you get your training? Yeah. It's a legit question. So once, once uh, you and I are both in agreement, uh, and n- not only in, in our patient population, but in the lifestyles that we lead, right? Like mm-hmm. you said, it's not just sticking a needle in your ass, uh, right. one day, one day a week. And that's, Oh, this is it. It's, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue doing everything I was fucking doing before or not doing before and eating no. like shit and everything else. No, you're not. So not my practice, you're yeah. Not. Yeah. So, so yeah. what needs to come along with that? Well, you know, again, if, if you, there are guys out there that they just, they have low testosterone and they, but they, you know, they just want a prescription. So, you know, th- there are a lot of these TRT window clinics, which um, have sprung up to cash in on that, mm-hmm. you know, and you'll get, well, th- you, you'll get what you ask for essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what those guys need to realize is that they're shortchanging themselves they, they are, they're not experiencing the full benefits of having an optimal level of testosterone. Mm-hmm. And those full benefits only come when you do the, the, it's the, the trifecta of age management, which is hormonal optimization, which includes testosterone, but also includes mm-hmm. other hormones sometimes. Um, it's low glycemic anti-inflammatory nutrition mm-hmm. and it's high, it's high intensity exercise. Yep. Um, and everybody is, focused laser focused on the hormones because that's sexy Mm -hmm. but where the money is is in the other two right um and so if you need help with that which a lot of people do you know you're not going to get that at a windmill trt clinic necessarily yeah you know you might but you might not um so you want to go to a doctor that knows how to do that or at least can refer you to somebody who can help you with that yeah so, um, you know, the Cynogenics program, I, you know, as again, I train there. It's, it's extremely expensive. It's not for everybody. But the physicians, they're all manage the hormonal part of things. And they also were extremely knowledgeable in the, in the other two. But they also had an, uh, uh, at least a master's degree trained exercise physiologist and a nutritionist mm-hmm. on the staff that you were personally assigned to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so because that's how important it is you know, that, that you do these other two parts. And so, um, you know, it's, you're only shortchanging yourself. If Mm -hmm. you, if you pin yourself, you know, once a week, twice a week, whatever, you know, and, and you don't do the rest of it, you'll feel a little bit better probably, Mm -hmm. but you know, you're missing out. You're still going to have, if you're destined, you're going to have a heart attack at 50, you'll still have your heart attack at 50. (laughs) Probably. And then, then, and then having an optimal level of testosterone, you, you tell me how much that helps you when I'm intubating you in the, in the ICU. <laughs> right. You know, you have yeah. a 900 test and, and you, cause you've got a big STEMI and mm-hmm. I've, you know, you're in VFIP. Yeah. So, yeah. So. You know, when it, when it comes to nutrition recently, I had somebody uh, reach out to me about their cholesterol. Yeah. And uh, their number actually was not that bad. And I said, look, mm-hmm. I don't, that's not in my wheelhouse. I don't, yeah. I, and, and yeah. also I know that dogma is shifting away from a lot pharmacological treatment of it. Uh, it's, you know, the, the numbers talk about numbers that should probably be adjusted. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's probably a pretty good example, but it's, it's funny because I said, I said, what's your diet like? And I, every time I ask that question, I get almost, almost an identical answer. And that's, uh, uh you know, yeah, generally I eat pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. A tall course. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which means, which means, uh, which, which means like uh, you talk about the range of testosterone, the range of what that statement means is, is everything between um, I only get two scoops of ice cream instead of three. (laughs) It's it's just like your definition of pretty good is probably not the same as my definition. Right. Right. Just just like your, your definition of an emergency is yeah. not the same as my definition. Yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge advocate of the, of the food lock. Because, oh, yeah. you know, cause that's it's honest. like, that's all right. You know, it's, and it's funny because when I went to, when I'd never kept a food log until I went to, to OPEX round rock, started working out there. And my coach said, 
He said, I don't, he said, I don't even know if we're going to do anything with it, but I want you to keep a food log for a week. Cause I just want to know, yeah. you know, I know what you're doing in the gym. I'm telling you what to do and I'm watching you do it. He goes, but I want to know what you're putting in fuel wise. And he mm-hmm. goes, cause I, cause he, cause, and same thing. And I, and I gave him probably the same fucking answer. He said, you know, how you, and I'm like, oh, generally you're pretty good. Sure. And he goes, what'd you, what'd, what'd you have for lunch yesterday? And I said, I, I had a, I had a salad with some chicken. He goes, well, what do you mean by a salad? Cause that means right. different things to different people. Right. It's, it was there, was there fucking pepperoni? I don't know if you've seen that joke. It's like, I, I made myself a salad last night. I decided to put some tomatoes on it and some meat and some cheese. Okay. It was a fucking pizza, but you, it was a pizza, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you know, it, it, Open to interpretation. Right? Yeah. Well, that's what, you know, the yeah. difference. Uh, I actually learned this from uh, the nutritionist uh, that was assigned to CAG is oh. the, the difference between a pizza and a caprese salad is basically just the crust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the caprese salad, that. the caprese salad is, is better for you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Well, absolutely. We're, we're, absolutely. we're running towards the end of time here, but yeah. what, what would you say? So to the 20, 30 year old, who's listening to this podcast, what would you say to them to start doing now to maybe preserve, to, to maybe put the pause button to, to, to kick the can down the road on, maybe yeah. they won't have to be on TRT. You know, mm-hmm. you, you started in your late thirties. Yeah. Um, I started uh, basically in my mid quasi late forties. Yeah. Um, what would you say to someone that they, things they can do now to kick that can possibly kick that can yeah. further down the road, maybe yeah. wait till they're in their fifties. Okay. Uh, I'll do my best to keep it brief. So there, you know, it, this low testosterone phenomenon that we're seeing globally, um, you know, I boil it down to th- there are things that are within your control and things that are not, that are outside of your control. Mm-hmm. So endocrine disrupting compounds in the environment and our foods and our water supply largely outside of your control. Right. Right. Uh, you, know, you can certainly like limit limit your plastic exposure as much as possible. I cook in only, only iron skillets. I drink mm. out of glass and metal lined bottles only. Um, it probably helps a little. You know, the fact is this, the shit's everywhere. We can't get away from it. It's on the receipts. Mm-hmm. It's on your, um, you know, your your your, your, your detergents, your soaps, mm-hmm. your co- your cosmetics, all this crap. Mm-hmm. So very difficult to get rid of that. So. <laughs> Anytime, anytime you're inhaling new car smell, you're probably killing yourself. New car smell. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's like BPA through Z. You yeah. Know, they're all bad. They're all, all bad. So, okay. With that in mind, the number one thing you can do is either don't get fat. And if you're fat, stop it. Mm-hmm. Um, and your goal is 10 to 15% body fat. And I don't, and I don't mean like, like you, you got one of those cheap little handheld, scales or you, you use the little tape measure like in the military and you know your neck now get a good accurate you know uh body fat uh yeah. measurement and your goal is 10 to 15 percent and that is that's going to be the biggest challenge for the vast majority of men that because, it's hard it all, is it is hard we totally we we yeah. easily we uh we underestimate our body fat percentage most all guys think that they're stronger better looking and can fight better than they really can <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna, especially, you know, they, this, especially this the fighting, fact. especially the fighting part, <laughs> especially the fighting part. And yeah. then they come to jujitsu and Muay Thai class and they learn different. But, yeah. um, you know, they look in the mirror and they're like, eh, I'm looking at like 16 percent. And then they get on a good scale and it's like 24, 25. So so get your body fat down. Your other job in your 20s, in my opinion, if you want to live again, we're, we're training for our 80s. Right. This right, is right. in my in my mind. We're training for the last 10 years of your life. Your job, I want you to put on as much skeletal muscle tissue as your genetics will allow you to do mm-hmm. between now and the time that you're 50. Mm-hmm. Because after 50, it's not that you can't put on muscle. It, dude, it's hard. It just, oh, you can attest, I, yeah, I know it. I can yeah. attest. Yeah, yeah. Now I put I, on, I put on two pounds of muscle last week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, well, it's not as easy as it used to be. But you're yeah. regaining muscle that you already had. Right, right. When yeah. we're talking about brand new muscle tissue, like I, I'm Ooh, just, yeah. I'm scratching out like an ounce of new muscle tissue here and there. Yeah. And then, you know, if I'm off for a week or two and diet and I don't keep my calories up, it's gone. Mm-hmm. So you've got it, you know, in your 20s, you're never going to put on muscle tissue like you will in your late teens and 20s. So you've got to take care of that. Um, so, and that, and I don't mean like, with lightweights, you need to do, you know, 
heavy compound lifting, you know, within the, the limits of safety and whatnot. Uh, if you want to do CrossFit and all that stuff, it's great. I don't mind that, but do it in such a way that you're training for hypertrophy and strength. You need to get as strong as you can uh, between now and the time you're 50, and you need to get your body fat percentage as close to sub 15 as you can. And then, you know, obviously the way you do both of those things is you need to eat a really healthy, you know, uh, low inflammatory, low glycemic diet. That's a whole other podcast on what that mm -hmm. looks like. Okay. Um, and there's different versions of that, but if you do all of those things, if, if, if you've put on 30 pounds of muscle tissue between the ages of 20 to 30, 20 to 35, you're walking around 11% body fat. You're probably not going to have symptomatic low testosterone. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying no, you can't, you absolutely can't. I did at 38. I had a, I actually had a, a, a genuine medical condition that I was born with that caused it. We can talk about that later. But um, if you do those things, the chances of you needing to be on TRT in your late 30s, early 40s is greatly reduced. Maybe you can push that forward, mm -hmm. right? Push it forward into your 40s, even your 50s. Um, I just did a consult with a guy who's in his early 60s who's basically been doing everything I just said his whole life. Mm -hmm. Total testosterone was over 700 wow. at age 61. Wow. And he felt, and I went through the questionnaire from him, and, and dude, it was no, 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 no to everything. Mm -hmm. So he's like, do you think I still need testosterone? I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I think you need to keep doing what you're doing and you need to share what you're doing with as many people as possible. He was 61 mm -hmm. years old. He looked great. Yeah. So, so that is, that is possible. Um, the one little caveat to this, to this that I do want to say, cause I, we haven't talked about it. When, when you get diagnosed with low testosterone, please ask your doctor, why do I have low testosterone? Make sure that they've done a workup for mm -hmm. that. There are potentially, thankfully they're relatively rare, serious medical conditions out there, life-threatening medical conditions that will cause low testosterone. And so you want to make sure that they're checking for that stuff. You know, it's all about due diligence. If you walk in and you show them a piece of paper that has a low testosterone number and you walk out with a testosterone prescription, that's malpractice. Yeah. Oh, that's dude. I, I told yeah. you that I, I, yeah. I've told you this story and I think I've mentioned it multiple times here on the podcast is uh, I reached out to a sample of, of retired special forces guys right around my age. And I just, I wanted to get a feel for what type of physicians they were going to and how much they were getting charged uh, basically. And yeah. uh, one guy told me, he says, yeah, yeah. I went to my doctor and uh, I said, yeah, I think maybe I need my levels checked. And if he said, well, if you just want to get jacked, I'll just put you on it. Like literally without even checking a fucking level. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, my doctor's so cool. I said, your doctor's no, he's not, not cool. No, he's not cool. No, he's not cool. No, he's <laughs> In fact, not. he shouldn't be practicing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he has just assumed major medical liability on mm -hmm. himself. And he certainly hasn't done that guy any favors. No. And, and you, no. Feel, you feel like they have, but, but they absolutely yeah. have not. Yeah. 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 You know, Good. I... Uh, Good I, stuff. I'm 100 with that. So just, just with all this testosterone stuff, I just want to make sure that I verbalize that because I have seen that happen a few times, and and you know, make sure that they. I spend most of my time honestly talking guys out of testosterone. Wow. And, and what I do, and and what I mean by that, because I'm not a I'm not a salesman, dude. I'm a doctor. I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a testosterone salesman. So I I they already come in with, they kind of know what the pros are because they've been mm -hmm. on the forums. They've, they've talked to their buddies. Right. So I spend almost the full initial consult telling them all the downsides of testosterone because nobody's ever talked to them about that. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. What yeah. do you mean? I'll, I'll be infertile. Yeah. What do you mean? My balls shrink. What yeah. do you mean? I could go bald. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, dude. I'm like, you know, like you need to know, you need to know about all these things. Yeah. And I'm shocked that, you know, that other physicians don't always talk about that stuff so you know what the ball start with the negatives the ball shrinkage is not a bad thing because you yeah. know as, as you get older okay. you know we talk you, you know all the jokes about you know you have the you know your saggy balls as you get older that's because your balls are bigger right right so uh, so yeah so uh, it, that's uh, yeah so it was much more difficult maintaining my balls in a cup pre-trt for jujitsu 
than it is afterwards. Ah, a little, see. little too much information for the listeners, but you know, you know, hey, get, you, you know, know, take take that one home. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's a pro pro tip from Dr. Mike. Simpson. Pro tip, pro <laughs> tip, easier to get the book because you know that you know you look at a yeah. cup and you're like, God, it's so narrow at the base there, and I got I got to kind of stack my shit to get it in there. Way easier now, way easier. Never even have to worry about it. I'm gonna. I have to work that into my. <laughs> I'm gonna work that into my consent form. <laughs> where can uh, where can people find you? Uh, yeah. I know you're not a big social media guy. First kind of all, so find. so so plug both of your books, which are both on Amazon. Yeah. So the it, you know the testosterone one. Um, oh, well, I, I just you just happen to have a copy. I just right happen to have a copy. Yeah. Right here. I just happen to have a copy right behind me. So oh, this is it here. It's so it's this. I wrote this. I wrote this for guys in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and, you know, re recently retired guys. So, um, it's a testosterone replacement field manual, practical hormonal op optimization for the modern man, FM TRT 001. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is written like with your help, actually, like <laughs> cosmetically, this is like the Ranger handbook, Yeah, you yeah. know, the special forces medical guide. So it's written like that. So this is, um, you know, it's written in bullet form. It will give you everything you need to know. Um, you know, there are a lot a lot of books on TRT. Um, Jay Campbell has a really good uh, TRT Bible, but it's this thick, mm. which you know doesn't mean you shouldn't read it. In fact, you should read it. But if if you need if you want to read something a little thinner mm -hmm. that basically has all the same information but doesn't embellish too much, mm -hmm. um, and what I encourage guys to do, obviously buy my book, but then pass this up when you're done with it. Give it to your buddy, like mm -hmm. just like in the military, just pass these handbooks on. I don't care if your body buys one or not. Just, I, I just want this information out there. Um, and uh, so if, you know, th this shouldn't be your only source for testosterone if you're kind of looking into this, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I think guys will find it useful if they want a quick reference guide um, in there. And then my, my other book is called the program. It's getting a little dated. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm actually, I'm in the middle of a rewrite. It's going to be a massive rewrite on it. So in that book, I'm going to talk a lot more, about the nutrition and the training part of this and the body composition stuff, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, guys, they do need direction with that. And, you know, they're like, uh, so many guys are like, just tell me what to eat and I'll do it, mm -hmm. which I'll, I'm willing to do that for guys, but I'd rather like teach you how to eat so that you know on your own. And then maybe you can go help somebody else yeah. rather than me just spoon, spoon feeding you. Like I, I actually would like you to learn something. Um, so I'm, I'm going to rewrite that book. Um, and that's out there. Um, I run a small telemedicine practice. Um, it is age management only. It's not, if you're looking for a TRT clinic, you can reach out to me and I, and I can ref, like give you some thoughts on some good ones if you just want TRT. But, um, but my, my emphasis is on age management. So if you want to be in the top 5% for your age group in terms of your overall health, uh, that's what I focus on. That's at manmedicine.com. Um, to get a hold of me, uh, probably the best thing, you know, I, I recently dipped my toe into YouTube. So I have a YouTube channel, Man, Man Medicine. It's, uh, it's a work in progress, but my, just my email, which is my first and last name, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W, Wingy, W-I-N-G-E, M-D, and it's at manmedicine.com. So I get a lot of emails. I love talking to guys. If you have questions, if there's something I can do, if you just have something simple you want me to, to help you out with, you know, I'm not going to charge you just, but just reach out to me and I'll, I'm, I'm willing to help you. I also, you know, I'm, I'm licensed in a number of different States, but um, if, you know, if you already have a TRT provider, but you want to have a, um, you know, and like an advice only consult, I actually do a lot of those lately yeah. um, where we sit down for an hour or however long it takes, you know, I have a fee that I, I charge. I think it's very reasonable. And just like you and I are doing right now, Mm -hmm. You just sit there and, um, and I do my best to, to answer the questions that you have, set you up for success. Because a lot of guys, they want to keep their testosterone provider, but they, they're not getting the other parts of the, the higher level knowledge, um, you know, that maybe an age management trained doc like myself can impart, maybe the higher level endocrinology, um, you know, that, that I've forced myself to learn over the last 10 years. So I do a lot of those advice only consults. I love helping guys, um, you know, get better. Yeah. So, that's how they can get a hold of me. Yeah, man, you've got me excited for it. And that, like, you know, you and I have been talking about all this week is uh, that's 
that's the next stop for me. And I think I'm, I'm yeah. finally going to pull the trigger on that. You got to do it. My, yeah, my goal is before the end of this year to have, uh, to have that practice up and running. So between the yeah. training that I've gotten from you and, and we've talked about, I'm going to do some formal online training, yeah. uh, you know, just to, to cross those T's and to dot those I's. Yeah. And then uh, hopefully within the sometime in the next three or four months, I'll be able to to launch that practice, which I'm really awesome. looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, you guys will, guys out there will benefit a great deal from having you as their doctor. So. I hope so. I hope so. Well, brother, thanks for coming on, man. You know, you're Always welcome. Welcome anytime. Yeah, I'm um, gonna. We'll do it again soon. Oh we're yeah, gonna wait, we're not going to wait a year plus. No, no, no. Let's. We'll in fact, we'll, we'll make it a point in the very near future to get you mm -hmm. on. We can talk. Cause I talk about the glycemic index in, in my, yep. uh, my chapter, my tr nutrition chapter in my yep. book, but I think it's something that bears more talking about glycemic index, pro-inflammatory yep. stuff. You know, Jim Miller, I UFC have, fighter, Jim Miller, have you seen his, yep. uh, his cookbook? I haven't. No. Yeah. So he's got a, it's, it's called a the fighter's time. cookbook, you know, yep. and he's, he's, uh, he, you know, he, he's from Jersey and he contracted Lyme and he's had a lot of really bad sequelae oh, wow. from Lyme. Yeah. Right. So, so like yeah. if he eats anything pro-inflammatory, yeah. it, it, it just wrecks him. So That's luckily he, he lives on a farm. He grows, grows and hunts all of his food. So he really, and he's, and you look at the guy, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's now going to be a UFC hall of famer because he has more yeah. victories than anybody else. And he's never fucking missed weight in his entire career. And is his cookbook. It's a great, I bought it. It's a great book. Man. I'll check it it's, out. Yeah. It's you, it, it's, and I tell people, I'm like, if you, for, come at it from either angle. Come at it from the athletic angle or from the chronic medical problem angle. This is a great fucking book, and yeah. really anybody cool. can benefit from it. So yeah. yeah, definitely check it out. But we'll we'll definitely I need to get him on again. But but you and I need to sit down and do a deep dive on nutrition at some point. We will do this. Is this is endless hours? I mean, this stuff is it's complicated. Yeah, you know? like <laughs> we just scratched the surface of PRT today. Totally, we, totally. We didn't even go into depth on it. Yeah. Um, and. You know, so we'll do it next time. We will. We will. Uh, I'm going to close today with a quote from Norman Mailer, who said, masculinity is not something given to you, but something you gain. And you gain it by winning small battles with honor. Remember that, everybody. And until next time, live life like a warrior. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.